in considering syntonics uh, as a treatment protocol, there's a, a lot of research. I mean, this is a whole new field. Um, the, the photo biophysics field is really big now. There's a Dr. Oshman that has a, a really comprehensive book. I believe it's in my Norwalk office. Energy of Light, something like that. But he's actually going to be at that ILA meeting in April. So I'm excited to hear him speak again. I did hear him speak once before. and Very, very powerful. There's just tons and tons of research that's out there. A lot of it's being done in Europe, and the colored light therapy is being done in Europe, probably more than here. But really what they're finding is that light is a very, very powerful healing tool. And it brings balance and it actually helps the whole system and all the different biochemical reactions become potentiated or work the way they're supposed to. So if you think about it, the blood is uh, well, it's hemocytic. <laughs> so you're, you're getting red blood, we'll keep it simple, red blood cells. They're red because they respond to light. They, they absorb the, that color. So anytime you're exposed to light, that's why they use a lot of infrared light, um, which is in the red spectrum. So that actually helps to speed up the blood, move things faster, and decrease inflammation, help with healing throughout the body. So it, it's pretty amazing. It, it will greatly enhance the speed and efficiency of healing, of the body's own natural healing process, which is why it's very effective for the traumatic brain injury patients, because it actually can help <coughs> speed up the healing and decrease the inflammation. Um, because the light entering the eye um, is a direct way to hit the blood vessels. So, I mean, the skin covers all of our blood vessels, but when we actually apply light to the eye, you're stimulating the retina and you're having direct ac access to all the capillaries and the blood vessels in the retina. So you're having a, like a more immediate effect in the body. The other thing is that light is being passed through that whole body. So every 20 minutes, all the light, all, I mean, all the um, blood will pass through the retina. So all of the blood in the body will be irradiated with that color in 20 minutes, which is why they typically do 20 minutes of the colored light therapy. Um, but you can have changes everywhere because you're actually going through that vascular system and that vascular system goes to every area in the body. It goes to, through the pituitary, the pineal gland, the hypothalamus, which have profound effects throughout the body, um, through the nervous system, the, you know, basically at the cellular level, through the heart, through the um, brain stem, the vestibular system. So you're really touching every system in the body, circulation, digestion, I'm sorry, it's 50% of the blood passes through the eye every 40 minutes, so you need 25% in the 20 minutes. Um, and then the different colors are, have different frequencies, and those frequencies can create different changes. So the neurotransmitters will be um, either excited or inhibited based on certain colors. We tend to use the colors in combination because different colors will have different effects on the body. So um, that's why we will use multiple colors. So, and when we use the Greek, they use the Greek letters, but you might be using opposing colors like the alpha omega, would be the red and the blue. Um, you're also looking at it in the context of the entire nervous system. You've got the autonomic nervous system where you've got the parasympathetics and the sympathetic system. And they oppose each other to some extent, but there's actually new research that's coming out. Larry Wallace uh, wrote a good article for the College of Syntonic Optometry where he talked about, yes, you've got the sympathetic and parasympathetic, but they're either opposing, but sometimes they're actually mutually enhancing, or they can both be in, um, inhibiting. So it's much more complicated than we realized, but in trauma, 
there's a hyper arousal of that sympathetic system. And there's certain types of patients that are more on the um, parasympathetic side and those that are more on the sympathetic side. It's much more complicated than, than this, but when I first learned it, ESOs tend to be more parasympathetically driven. Think about their over overcompensation. So they're pulling in, and that, that's more a parasympathetic system. The parasympathetics engage the accommodative system. They make the pupil go smaller, <coughs> and they will actually you know, pull you into focus. Whereas the sympathetic system is your fight or flight, high alert. It's gonna, you're going to be opened up. You still will go more into a tunnel vision with that too if you're hype, so hyper aroused or if you stay in that state. But those patients tend to be more exo and have more trouble accommodating. Again, it's not quite that simple, um, but that's a good way to think of it initially. The pupil is a good way to look at what's happening in that autonomic nervous system. So when we're doing a um, an evaluation of a patient to determine whether or not we want to do syntonics in the first place, we're going to be looking at the pupils as well as the color visual fields and their symptoms, like what's going on, you know, what brought them in. But the pupils are really important because it tells us how we're interacting with the world. And if, as I mentioned before, if it's constricting, then they're responding to light, they're, they're um, accommodating, they're engaged. If it starts to dilate, which often happens with the pupils, when you constrict it with a light application, it should stay constricted. And a lot of these patients, it just lets go and it goes back to dilation. That's what we call an alpha omega pupil. It's not holding its constriction. Um, and when that happens, then you know that they're more on the sympathetic side and that they're, they're not in balance in their autonomic nervous system. Um, and you should use a regular illuminator rather than just a pen light because you want to make sure that it's consistent. So you actually did a whole rating system to determine the pupils. So the severity um, involves how quickly it dilates again once the lights shined on it. So you want to make sure that this light is the same you know, from visit to visit. So that's an important test that I do at the progress of that with the color visual field. And that's why it's important for the doctor to take a look when we do the color field. Um, so when the pupil dilates, it typically means that there's a general fatigue in the system or they're depleted or there might be toxicity. Um, they might be emotionally or mentally stressed. They might not have slept. So there's a lot of reasons it could dilate. So you want to really address and ask those questions. So the interns hear me regularly asking, do you get sleep? Or do you have trouble sleeping? Are you eating well? Because all of those things will affect that dilution. Um, and those are the things that I want to check in on, too. So the color field can change if they didn't sleep well, or if they're having a bad day, or if they got into a fight with their brother on the way there. So that's important for you guys can ask those questions, but that's why I also think the doctor or an intern should be there to check in on how they're doing that day, um, just to make sure that there's nothing else that's affecting that dilation. Um, well, what else? So in the handout, it explains about how, what the normal release time. So after about second seconds, seven seconds, it should release anyway. It will dilate. But most patients that we're seeing with colored field problems or needing vision therapy, it's dilating one to four seconds later, so that's all graded. Um, the other thing that there's a misconception about the color fields, because that's the other test that we're doing, it, the color field is not necessarily determining the color based on the field, so as you know, you do a white field, then you do the green, then the red, then the blue, GRAB is the acronym, but that doesn't mean if the green field's constricted, then we're going to give them green or if, we, if the red field is constricted, then we're going to give them red. It, it's, as always, in optometry, much more complicated than that. But it does give us an inf 
some information about where the problem is and what colors would be best to treat it. Um, we'll go over all of the details, and that's all on the section that says performing a color visual field. So we'll kind of review that. Um, and then, as I mentioned, there's, there's certain tests that we do in the optometric exam that I think are important that will give us an indication of how they do on the field changes. We often look at the prescription, their phoria, their near point of convergence, the ranges and recoveries um, are real important as well, not as important. Their flipper test, pursuits and saccades, if they have really jumpy eye movements, then they're more likely to have difficulties with the fields. Um, so eye movements are important when people release. We do like to look at the Van Orden star because it gives us an idea of how they're spatially projecting, how the eyes are working together. Um, there's a, one other test which is called the CAT test, where you actually look at the color saturation, the brightness of a red cap with one eye versus the other to see if there's a difference. 